This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Here we are. Can you believe it? Another week talking big smallmouth, talking about the top 52 smallmouth bass anglers across the country. And today's guest definitely deserves to be on that list. So I'm super, super excited to talk to him and discuss his adventures when it comes to smallmouth fishing. It's going to be a really, really good podcast for everyone, as well as the viewers on my YouTube channel, Smallmouth Crush. I welcome you to the Smallmouth Crush podcast. But before we bring on our next guest. Let's talk about the real shot. Of course, they have the most wanted bass tackle that a smallmouth crush fan could ask for. Top brands, you know the drill. Kytex, Jackal, Mega Bass, Omega, Dirty Jigs, list goes on and on. Shimano, they got the, the usual stuff too. The Rapalas, the Berkeley, VMC, they got it all. If you head on over to their website, therealshot.com, use my promo code Smallmouth Crush 15. It's going to give you 15% off your first order. So definitely head on over there and get some tackle before your next big bass outing or your big tournament coming up. Let's get into it. Frank, how are you doing? What's going on? Man, excited. You're definitely the top. You might be the top five. Can we say top five smallmouth anglers of all time? Can we go there? Yeah, I want you to say that. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That, that I, I can live with that. <laughs> that. That works. Yeah, I got some buddies that were calling. Like, dude, why, 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 why am I not on the list? I go, well, if there was a top 60, you'd probably make it. So you got to uh, give them that. You got to give them, you got to tease them with that line. You know, you yeah. got to give them the line to cross. Man, so you've done it all. You've been all over the place fishing smallmouth. I mean, obviously you, you, you love bass fishing in general. It's it's not only smallmouth that you uh, that you dominate in, but really today's focus. You know, I wanna I wanna kind of talk to you as far as some of your success, of course, on Lake Erie and and some of the things you've encountered across the country. But before we get to that point, if you don't mind, if you could take a a few minutes here and just introduce yourself to some of the viewers or listeners that may not be familiar with you, a little bit of background as far as your location in the country and Really, what what drives you when it comes to smallmouth fishing? Well, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, which is I live right on the lake. I actually I used to really live on the lake, but I moved a little bit inland now. But I'm only eight minutes from the lake, so I grew up fishing on Lake Erie and basically cut my teeth there. That's um, that's probably why I'm actually I'm a good structure fisherman. I love structure fishing more than anything. I'd rather be offshore than near the bank. So Lake Erie lend itself real well to that. Um, you know, I, I wanted to fish Bassmasters my whole life. And, you know, with family and responsibilities, I had to prolong it and prolong it. So I really got a late start in the Bassmaster game. I think I was 38 when I started. Hmm. Uh actually fishing on the elites. So, um, but it was fun. It was a good ride. I, I love fishing all over the country. Um, I don't compete anymore in tournaments, but, uh, I still fish all over the United States. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a plus. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. You still get the opportunity to do it. Uh, so you grew up fishing Lake Erie. I mean, you're familiar with it. it it's, uh, it's definitely one of the when you think of smallmouth fishing, you have to think of Lake Erie. There's, there's a, there's a big group of top anglers that come from that section. I don't know what it is. Uh, if you look at all the top anglers, a majority of them are from that, you know, Michigan over to, uh, oh, yeah. Ohio, right in that zone. And so it's a training ground, you know, for smallmouth studs, really. Um, you mentioned offshore. I love it. That's where I'd rather be. I know a lot of people that are listening to this may struggle when it comes to fishing offshore, especially if they're new to bass fishing and smallmouth fishing and big water in general. It can be very intimidating. Uh, I, I like to, you know, just get a little bit of uh, a background on some of your successes. Obviously, you've, you've done well in tournaments there. Uh, a lot of it was offshore. You know, what are some of your most 
memorable, uh, memorable experiences as far as tournaments that you've that you've been in in the past? Wow, you, you know, I, I I love them all, even the ones I did terrible in, <laughs> because you learn from them. You know what I mean? The whole the whole excitement to me is fishing a new body of water. That's really where the excitement lies because it's a new challenge. But um, you know, I have to be honest with you. Uh, some of my finishes on Lake Erie, you know, some of my wins, some of my second place stuff, that's all memorable because they're big, giant, small mouths. But, um, you know, when I won Buffalo, uh, that Bassmaster event in Buffalo, that probably had to be the a memory that I'll never forget in my life because we wound up experiencing 11 and 12 foot waves in that tournament. Uh, the weather wasn't supposed to do that. They, you know... I, you know, anytime you go to the Great Lakes, you always have to follow the weather report. So during that event, I was monitoring the weather like a madman. And the, it was supposed to be two to three footers uh, the one day, and it was going to build four to fives. And mm -hmm. then the, the following day was supposed to go flat, and the third day was supposed to go flat. So what wound up happening was we launched, I'll never forget this, we launched our boat in the morning in the harbor all the way in the, you know, by the Niagara. Mm -hmm. and and we're getting ready to go out and we're in the protected water and i can feel my boat just going you know just going up and down up and down i said well that's probably a little bigger than two to threes uh -huh. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah well when we went out there i was making about a 17 mile run was this i'm sorry was this day one yeah day or, one okay okay day one and um you know the funny thing is i ran into this guy in the parking lot prior to um the meeting the day before and he was a young guy and he's like man i hope it blows like a hurricane i'm gonna win this thing hands down and i said hey dude you got we're on lake erie man you better be careful what you wish for you uh -huh. know what i mean just just as a thing not not it being a smart ass just as a thing mm -hmm. and um sure enough launch the boat day one start going out to where I got to go. And the farther out I get, the bigger the waves are getting. And I'm like, these waves are building. I told my non-boater, I said, dude, I said, we're going to be in for it today because we're, we're tucked back in the far east corner of the lake and the wind's straight out of the west mm -hmm. and it is honking. So literally by the time I got to my first rock pile, we were already in seven and eight footers and i said wow this is going to be tough man so i got three drift socks out because i had to slow the boat down because we okay. were motoring man so i put the three drift socks out and it was taking me a long time to get my drift down where i could drift over these rock piles because i what the stuff i was fishing was actually uh glacier deposits okay. so they're not contours on any map it's not a main structural element it's just isolated little you know glacier deposits some of them about the size of a car some of them about the size of a half a car mm -hmm. and so it was taking me 15 to 20 drifts to get over top of it and then i would hook one and by the time i landed them we were so far away from it i'd have to pull everything in start up drive back over well so this went on for the better part of the day. And I said, you know what? We better go because I don't know how long it's going to take to get back. Right. And it took us a long time to get back. Well, we got back and I wasn't worried because the weather forecast said the lake was going to lay down the second day. Right. So I didn't think twice about it. And usually with Lake Erie, especially Lake Erie, if you get a bad blow and the lake goes flat, usually you're going to have a flat lake for the next three days. That's just the way it goes. So I wasn't worried. So I come into the tournament, weigh in. I'm in second place. I'm like, oh, cool. What did, <laughs> you, know you, have, what did you have for weight that day? Do you remember? You know, I it was too – Or was it, it – let had, me ask, it, did, it, you, did you know you had a good bag when you were starting to head in? Were you happy with what you had? Yeah, I, I knew I was in contention. So okay. I had to have somewhere between, you know, 18, 18 and or over. Mm -hmm. I, I don't recall. That was, what, 2005, I think. I don't mm -hmm. even remember. But anyway, that was my first bass win. But anyway, um, so what happened was day two did. It went flat as, it, dude, it was flat as glass. Uh -huh. So I was pumped. So I run out there, but the problem was now is because we had no wind, we had no movement. 
um, now was a struggle to catch big ones. So uh, basically, I, I wound up fishing two baits in that tournament. I fished a four inch yum dinger on a on a three eighth and a half ounce jig head, and um, I fished an eerie darter on a on the same setup, half mm -hmm. ounce and three eight three eighth ounce jig head. Wound up catching them, so I was pumped and went in st still maintained second place but i was just a smidge out of first you know so i said so i was like cool i i dude i slept like a rock that night because mm -hmm. i'm like we're having a flat lake tomorrow tomorrow i got places that i can really run to we're we're it's gonna be a day well dude that second day blew like a flipping hurricane uh. and i mean the canadian coast guard cutter came out to see if i needed to be rescued because i was literally in the middle of the lake and so <laughs> yeah. here you know you go down in the waves and you can't see anything but water you come up on top and you can see the whole world you know what i mean and and so i came up and i saw this giant ship coming at me mm. And I didn't know at the time it was the uh, the Canadian Coast Guard. I I thought it was a ship, and I'm like, this dude's not going to see us. Jeez, you know what yeah. I mean? He and he's yeah. coming. He's coming like right at me. Uh huh. So all of a sudden, he's way close for my comfort. But I see the big Canadian leaf, and I see the helicopter and the scarab on top of it. You know, the rescue boat. So yeah. now I know what he is. So. So he gets on his loudspeaker and he's like, do you need assistance? You know, and it's, dude, it's like God talking, you dude. know, you just, it's, it was the loudest thing on earth. And, and we could of course hear him, but there's no way on earth. He's going to hear me tell him, get, get away from me. You know what right, I mean? Right. So I, so I told my non-boater, I don't know what the international sign is for get the, you know, get the F <laughs> out of here. So he's coming and coming and I'm like, he's going to get too close to me. I can't control. I got sure. you know, drift socks out everywhere. So yeah. I just stand up in my boat and I put my arms like across like this, you know, I stand up like this and I'm going, get, go like that. Go, go. So he finally gets on. the. He goes, we are leaving. And I'm like, yeah, get out of here. You know what I mean? So Dude. swear to God. So listen to this. This is crazy. This is the craziest story. That's why I can never forget this. So he goes and I, and I'm like, and in the beginning I was catching all these, you know, two pounders and i just kept throwing them back throwing them back one right after the other mm -hmm. and my non-boaters like dude you're you're just threw back like three limits of fish you have nothing in your live well i go you don't understand i can't win with these and if they die in here i have to keep them mm -hmm. and i'm not taking that chance so he got in my head he really did he got in my head and i'm like he goes you gotta start keeping those you gotta have at least five so i go yeah, maybe you're right. So boom, I get another one. I throw it in the live well. So I catch five little ones and throw them in the live well. Uh -huh. So I have probably 12 pounds maybe in my mm. live well, maybe 14. I don't know. I go, dude, we got to move. These are too small. We got to move. So it's it was arduous and it took forever because because he was afraid. Mm -hmm. So he didn't know he never got out of his passenger seat. So I'm spider crawling all over my boat, pulling in drift socks, you know, doing the drill, you know, the drill. Mm -hmm. And so we make a move and I start calling. Now I'm, now I'm on the right stuff and I'm calling and I'm calling and I'm on down to my last little fish I got to get rid of. And it, and dude, this is arduous, man. And it's taken forever. Mm -hmm. So I get down to the last fish. I got a big chunk and i'm like yes you know what i mean yes yeah. i grab that fish dude and its eyes are yellow and it's as solid as a board is dead as a rock oh, i'm man. like i go oh my gosh and i start and you know how it is dude you know you don't want to sure. you don't want to cry right. but i get the little lump in my adam's apple and i'm like mm, uh, you know what i mean and so i just turned around to my angler and i said I, man, I appreciate your concern, but you, you you can't you can't talk to me like that when I'm fishing. You know what I mean? Because I didn't want to keep them, and I would not have kept them. Yeah. So now I have a two two pounders, probably two four, dead that I own. So now the only way I could win this tournament is I need a five pounder, and 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 our day's done, dude. I'm like, we got to start going back. 
because it's I have no idea at this point because that day was worse than the first day. So I have no idea. We have to go back. So I pick up all the drift socks. I do all my stuff. We start heading back and I'm looking at my GPS because I'm trying to find a tack way where I can tack all the way across into Canada and then tack all the way back so I don't miss the mouth of the harbor mm -hmm. so here's what happens <laughs> i'm going back and i see a waypoint and i'm like how come i didn't fish that waypoint this whole tournament there's no track lines by it i go we got we got to make one slide on this real okay quick. so i spin the boat around i go over to it i throw all three drift socks out woom, 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 as fast as i can and i fire a cast out and you know how it is when your drift socks don't open yet sure you know the boat's still doing all the stuff Yep. All of a sudden, those three socks go, whoa, whoa, and they all open, almost <laughs> okay. throws me out of the boat. And as soon as they open, dude, my rod goes, whoa, and I set up on them like that. I go, mm -hmm. holy smokes. I said, this is, I said, please don't be a walleye or a sheephead. You know what I mean? Please, because right. this weight had some, this fish had some meat to it. So I'm fighting it and fighting it. And the waves are so big and so stacked that the fish is like five feet over my head in the water fighting i'm fighting them up there yep and and the line goes through that wave into the mm -hmm. next wave and the line is in the air in between the two you yep. know in between the two waves so i'm like oh my god i'm never going to catch this fish you know what i mean because every time we're up on top and slide down i got to give him line because sure. he's way back there yeah so yeah sh so sure enough this is d dude d i swear to god so so here's what happens so all of a sudden I get him and he's now he's on the wave in front of me. Okay. So he's literally like right in front of my face fighting, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. The boat goes to go up the other side of the wave. That fish jumps right into my boat. Come on. I swear on my life, dude, I dive on top of him like uh -huh. this and I, and I'm, I'm laughing. I'm ecstatic, dude. It's like a five, eight. So I, I'm, and I'm on top of him, right? Dude. Like he right. is not going anywhere, you know? So I, I unhook him and I throw one of the three plusers back because I got to keep the little one that mm -hmm. died. And I run in there and I, I said, we got to go right now. So all the way point and gone we are, you know what I mean? So yeah. here, so we're driving back and this is how big those waves are. Cause nobody believes me, but this is the truth. So I get halfway back. And I need, I just need a break. I got to take a, take a minute. You know okay. what I mean? Cause I'm yep. stressing and I'm, you know, doing everything. Uh huh. So I, I tell my non-boater, I said, take a breath, dude. We're just going to float for a while. And I'm just going to keep the boat pointed in the right direction. And go you're you're and fine down. on time. You you know, you got plenty of time yet to get yeah, in. You're not, yeah, you're, not well, it. you're comfortable. I, I'm, I'm comfortable, but stupidly comfortable. Okay. okay. Because yeah. I thought I was much closer to buff uh, to uh the launch ramp than i was mm -hmm. so so we're we go up the wave and i got the boat neutral drive neutral drive and all i'm doing is just keeping it so when we go down i can tack it and surf it down the other side so i'm not you know in a bad position so so we start we go down this wave and i hit my non-boater in the arm i go dude look at my gps 19.1 miles we're going 19.1 miles an hour in neutral Whew, right down the way i said i so i told him i said man at this rate i said we'll be back in buffalo in no time <laughs> you know what i mean right so i wound up picking up the stuff and we went in and i made it in with a minute to spare Ooh, yeah uh, i had one minute to spare when we got in Dang. it was crazy but i'll not i can never forget it it was the biggest water that i personally had ever been in yeah 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 it was that's crazy. uh that's the most epic story i've ever heard man when it comes to big water smallmouth fishing now your experience being out there in those big waves uh i guess it's a common you felt you, you probably didn't like it but you definitely dealt with it better oh, than yeah. others right Oh yeah. And so yeah. that made you realize you got to run to those fish. That's, that's what my next question is. You know, if someone's an experienced angler and you have big fish 15, 20 miles away, sometimes in big waves, do you suggest they go to those fish? You know, it's a crazy, it's a crazy thing. Cause, cause this is what I tell everybody. I I'm not an, I'm not nervous behind the wheel of my boat 
ever. But I am massively cautious and I am not stupid. Um, if there, if you have any uneasy feeling, you should never go mm-hmm. because if you start doubting yourself, listen, this is what I tell everybody. Bass boats are made to float. When, when you get into problems out there, it's always driver error. Mm-hmm. Like that day coming in, we, we went past five or six capsized bass boats coming back and i drove around looking for anglers in the water on top of all that and um you know i told my non-boater look for life jackets look for guys you know look for them and so i would we saw the boat one boat was upside down trolling motor was down but the trolling motor was you know sticking up in the air because the boat was upside down and um he asked me he goes how do they flip over did they hit a wave and flip over? And I said, no, no. What happens is the boat fills up with water. The bilge pumps can't get the water out fast enough. So when the boat goes up the other side of the wave, all the water runs down to one side of the boat and it just goes, it just goes, you know what I mean? It's not violent. It's not a violent flip over, but it's, you're done. I mean, you're done in the middle of the lake. So what happened was apparently they must've gotten, rescued because Mm -hmm. nobody was injured in the whole tournament and i and every boat we drove by i spent several minutes you know driving around looking for people which was part of the reason that i my time was cut you know close but you got to put you know you got to weigh it out but my advice is if you are squeamish about it or you feel in your heart that this is really bothersome to you don't don't go it's not worth it you know, it's not, it's a small mouth bass for crying out loud. It, it's not right. worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I like your take though. I mean, if you, if you are comfortable with your equipment and you do take your time and you know how to judge waves and, and you know, you don't want to spear consecutive waves in those types of conditions, you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? No, no. But yeah, it's sure. going to happen. I mean, it happens yeah. to me on a regular basis. You're going to spear waves. It's overcoming that, right? Not being yeah. scared because you're going to, you know, your first initial hit is going to be a little shock and you're looking yeah. down and you got to accept you got you got to access the situation you know is this water going to dump out quick enough or am i screwed here you know yeah and, that's uh, right <laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to yeah oh yeah absolutely oh. you know and so so that's yeah. my most that's my absolute most sure. memorable tournament yeah. of my life yeah is that one yeah i, I yeah. yeah you'll always remember that freaking day that th- those couple of days um oh yeah geez crazy okay so man we're we're 25 minutes in that was like an amazing story but we got to get in your head here when it comes <laughs> to smallmouth uh good stuff good stuff we could we could probably entertain people for hours on on this topic but you know what do you think separates you from other anglers when it comes to being able to stay and be consistent when it comes to smallmouth fishing on that big body of water and you know through through all your experiences what do you see areas where people really need to start making improvements if they want to start catching more fish. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a great thing because, um, you know, I spend this, the people are going to think I'm lying. I spend more time idling and looking than I do fishing. Um, the, the, the whole thing is I try to find stuff that people don't find, especially on Lake Erie. Now you're talking about places that are not going to give you 15 or 20 fish. They're going to give you two or three, but they're all going to be four to six pounders. Uh, That's what I look for whenever I fish a tournament on Lake Erie. I'm not Mm -hmm. going to catch a hundred of them. If I want to do that, I'll stay, you know, 15 to 18 feet deep and fish in, you know, May. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Um, that's not what I'm doing. So I spend a, a, an enormous amount of time looking. That's in fact, most of my time fishing is looking on that lake. Cause I know what I'm looking for, you know? Um, and here's the important thing, depth. Lake Erie is all about the depth you're fishing. Uh, back in the old days, when I was a kid, all we had to know is are the, what, how deep are you catching them? 18 feet. Great. You run out there, you throw two drift socks out and you float like an idiot in 18 feet all day long and you catch a ton of them, but it's mm-hmm. not like that anymore. The lake does not fish like that anymore. So with the advent of all these new electronics, you could find 
hidden gems because the electronics are so much better. Heck, we didn't even have GPSs back then. Right. You know what I mean? So your electronics are your electronics have to be an extension of your eyes in order to really, you know, do these Great Lakes smallmouths just mm -hmm. now the now conversely, some of the other Great Lakes smallmouths, you can fish them shallow on sand and grass flats. It just depends. Lake Erie's a little bit different than the rest of them. Mm -hmm. um, just like Champlain. Champlain's one of my all-time favorite smallmouth fisheries on earth. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not because I catch a lot of big fish there. I do catch big ones there, but it's not because of that. It's because the, the fishery is so diverse. Uh -huh. um, when I took second in Bassmasters up there, I was actually flipping smallmouths out of the grass. Wow. With a three-quarter ounce jig. So and totally go, different than what you're used to. 110% different. Right. Um, some of it was the same. You know, the first time I ever went to Champlain, it was real similar to Lake Erie. I was drop shotting um, almost the entire tournament, 18 to 22 feet, drop shotting. The fish were, it was like manna from heaven. And um, the, and I wound up, I think, seventh in that tournament. And then then the next one we went to was a mix, which was the first time I got into on that lake other than you know typical smallmouth fishing i mm -hmm. was actually looking for residual largemouth to help my bag limits up a little bit okay. and wound up getting on these big giant smallies in grass and mm -hmm. i said whoa 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 you know what i mean then the yeah. bell went off so then i readjusted what i was doing i think i took seventh or eighth in that one we went to the next we went there again and and that was when I took second when we went there again and and I said now now I there's a whole different animal that lives in this lake, so I found some deep fish, I found some topwater fish, and I found those fish in the grass and it was the coolest thing too because they what what the key with the grass was they wanted the two types of vegetation mixed. Okay. So I wound up I wound up looking for cabbage grass mixed in with coontail or uh, milfoil and when i found that i caught the big small mouths and the big small mouths i was catching in that tournament i didn't catch one of those deeper than eight feet hmm. which was which was you know i'm okay with 20 pound test line and a you know right. what i mean i'm good with that but right but yeah so i i wound up really falling in love with the place just because it appealed to my structure fishing senses but it also appealed to, you know, my shallower instincts. So I liked mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it was good. So uh, on Erie, you, you really tend not to look shallow at all, right? I want to say, I want to say that. Kind of but in time of year, I guess. Yeah. I mean, Condition. depending on, right. But, you know, I want to say that, but here, look, in 2009 or 10, um, I took third on Lake Erie burning a spinnerbait in two feet of water. Oh. But, but here, that was one day. I, I had to go to my deep fish the next day because the, the second day was canceled. So the, the third day I had to go to my deep fish because the big waves and wind screwed up all my shallow stuff. Did you so, not even bother looking shallow that, that next day? You knew that wasn't going to happen? No, I actually, like a dumbass, I went. <laughs> I went yeah. to them and, and I was fishing so shallow that when the rollers picked me up and set me down, they were slamming my boat on the bottom. Yeah. And I said, this, there's no way I burned the spinner bait a couple of times. I couldn't get them to go on it. Cause I think I, they vacated because mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to stay in that they vacated. So I just turned around, told my non-boater, we got to, we're heading out, man. I, I'm not mm -hmm. wasting one more second here. We're gone. Sure. sure. You know, well, it's making those adjustments, you know, obviously part of being successful, but you know, you've, you've chased smallmouth all over the country. Okay. Besides Champlain, oh, yeah. uh, the Great Lakes, you know, so you obviously have some type of, uh, you know, instinct when it comes to being able to locate those fish, you know, a Champlain grass is totally different than, you know, 40, 60 feet, yeah. 30 <laughs> miles offshore and eight oh, footers. Yeah. Uh, so there's gotta be your, your mindset going in or, you know, how do you, how do you make these adjustments all over the country and still stay on these smallmouth? Like wh where's the, where's the training ground? Like, well, how did all this happen? Well, I mean, the, the reality of it is, is one, you, if you understand the animal, okay. Smallmouth is a very aggressive bass. 
it's more aggressive than spotted bass even which i can't believe because spotted bass are insane but so understanding their aggressive nature lets you know that if you actually find them the likelihood of you catching some is very good okay so yep. so what happens is like on like on table rock um when i first went to table rock i actually didn't do very well there and i targeted largemouth and spotted bass i knew okay. it had small mouth in it but i didn't fish for them okay um and i got my clock clean dude i mean i got waylaid and um the next time i went to table rock i was fishing standing timber in 38 40 feet of water some of the some of the bottom depths were 70 but the trees were up to you know okay 30 30 feet and i was just drop shotting on top of the treetops and i was catching good spotted bass doing it and then i caught a couple smallmouth and i went oh uh oh you know what i mean uh oh right. wait a minute and mm -hmm. so i was too late in that event for me to change my tactics because i couldn't find enough smallies okay. so i stayed with the spots the next time we went there i did nothing but look for small mouths huh. and was catching every time i stopped the boat i would catch 18 to 20 pounds worth every time i shut my boat down the water was coming up about eight feet six to eight feet every single day in this event and i was like oh my gosh you know so i thought at first i thought the fish were going to move up with the water they stayed at the same depth so every day i just added more feet to my fishing depth well we got the notice on the final wow. day of practice that Bassmaster has canceled the event and the uh dnr in a uh, table rock said everybody off the water lakes closed <laughs> right and so I was driving around looking for someone to fish with me the rest of the day because I was wrecking them. So I ran into Crete. And he's like, no, I'm out. I ran into Mark Tucker. He's like, I'm out of here, dude. And I said, well, I'm going to fish by myself. Uh, so I went right. out fishing, fun fishing, right? Sure. Well, I, I come underneath the bridge at Kimberling City, and I had to take my freaking seat off to get underneath the bridge. And if anybody's been there, that bridge is you know, uh -huh. a mile high, not really a mile, but it's hot. Sure. So I went to the parking lot to get my boat out and my, my truck was under, not <laughs> underwater, but right. the water was up to the doors on my truck. So I literally almost idled my boat to my truck and I tied it off to a guardrail and I straightened the truck out and put it on the trailer, hooked it up and, and got out of there. And, um, don't, you know, Br uh, Branson, uh, Branson City or whatever it is below the dam flooded out. The water went and flooded the place out. So it was it was nuts, man. Dude. I never seen that in my life. I mean, it was crazy. So you had to have been upset with the cancellation of the tournament, obviously, right? You were on these big smallmouth. You didn't get a chance to go after them. No, I didn't. I would have been, yeah. I was sick to my stomach. Now the did yeah. they uh did they go back there or did they just move the tournament to a different body of water at some, at a later date? I'm almost sure they moved it to a different yeah. body of water. Yeah. yeah. I, I was sick, dude. I, I was I said, you know what? That's perfect. It, it just fits right in with all Cleveland sports. <laughs> sure. So, so so these fish you found were those where were those smallmouth? Were they in the trees as well or no? Or was it a different pattern? No, it was a different pattern. Here's okay. what was going down. These fish were these fish were actually pure pre-spawn and so they were on these pea gravel bars that went way out they weren't on steep banks they were on these long pea gravel bars but they were on the inside swings of them so everywhere that a secondary channel swung inside these pea gravel that's where they were i mean it was it was it, dude it was picture perfect pre-spawn smallmouth mm. only they were way deeper than i thought they would be and they never moved with the water hmm. yeah what 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 kind of baits were you using to target those i you know this was way before the ned rig was mm -hmm. invented i was throwing a 1 16th and a 1 8th ounce uh shaky head and a four inch yum dinger sure yeah and i was throwing green pumpkin purple <laughs> yeah back then yeah dang that's crazy yeah that's, that's like, I, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know how to overcome that. You know what I mean? I've never had a situation where you're on fish like that. You had to have been just pumped going into practice, staying on these fish. Oh, yeah. 
you know, even with water moving up six, eight feet a day, those fish staying, you, you, you just gotta be chomping at the bit to get at it. And then they just go cancel it. So, uh, dang, dude, that's, uh, that's bad <laughs> luck right there. That's bad. Luck. That's, that's just the way it goes. It's You'll never fishing. know the outcome. Right. Right. Out of all the places that you fished, where would you say your, your, I guess, where do you love to go catch smallmouth? Do you have any place in particular that you just gravitate to and you just love being there? Champlain. Is it Champlain? Oh yeah. 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 I, just because, just because one day I could be catching them my top waters over 20 feet of water. The next day I could be flipping grass and mm -hmm. the next day I could be drop shot and rock piles. Real diverse. Yeah. It's very diverse. What would you say your favorite technique to target smallmouth is now, nowadays? Yeah. That's tough. That's tough, dude. Cause mm -hmm. I just like catching them. So whatever I'm catching them on is my, so favorite. you're real well diverse. You'll do whatever you do. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Like spooning, spooning is spooning is actually like, I, I, I get a charge out of spoon fishing for them. Okay. Because, you know, I put 17 pound fluorocarbon on, I use a three quarter ounce CC spoon and it's just game on. I, I take the hook that it comes with off and I put a uh, number two round bend Gamagatsu treble on there because when they bite that spoon, that big gaff of a treble hook pins their mouth shut and they can't they can't shake it okay they, they can't get rid of it so i just winch them to the boat flip them in the boat you know there's no monkeying around i mean it's just it's like power fishing for smallmouth really well let's dig into this uh because this is an interesting topic it's it's if if you were to ask me what my biggest weakness is when it comes to smallmouth fishing i would say it's throwing a spoon um because i just don't do it probably enough or that, that well, to say the least, is that a cold water technique for you or is that year round? Year round. I never go is on. It? I never hit any great lakes without a spoon on ever. Year well, round. Year, year round. round. Year round. Okay. Yeah. That, that's the misconception here. Here's the yeah, thing. With I'm the listening. Spoon. I'm listening. The misconception, the spoon is a fantastic cold water lure, mm -hmm. but as good as it is in the cold water, it's even better when it's not cold. So here's what happens. Yeah. The the technique that I do in the warm weather periods, because I fish this thing all year. So the, the techniques that I do is I put I put a crane swivel, I put a the crane swivel on the on the back of the spoon. That gives me a lot of movement on the spoon. I'm not tying direct to the spoon. Okay. Okay. I use the crane swivel. Then I change the hook out to a number two treble, 17 pound fluoro. Cause when I'm fishing the spoon, the smallies don't care about line size. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They're just reacting to that madness of a spoon. You mentioned it. Can you, what was the name of the spoon? If you don't mind giving that up. Yeah. It's called a CC spoon. CC yeah. spoon. Okay. Yeah, it's a, I think cotton Cordell makes it. Okay. And so, so then, so here's, here's the whole key to this. Okay. When I see the fish on my locator, if I see one, I can catch it. I'll drop the spoon down. I'll watch that spoon go right down to the fish. But when I see it, if the fish is suspended, I don't let the spoon go below the fish. I stop it about a foot above them. Okay. And then I, I do a double pump. I do a little and then I pu pull it up and I follow it down, follow the slack line down. Yep. So I got a bow in my line, but I'm following it down. Cause when the fish hits it, you got to be ready to get them. Sure. And I, and on my locator, I watch that fish Well, I can see that fish gets edgy. He starts coming up to the spoon. So now I know I got him. He's going to, mm. he's, I'm going to catch him on the next pump. And so that's what I do when I can see him. Now, when I'm structure fishing with it, this is an entirely different animal, and this is important. Mm -hmm. I let the spoon go all the way to the bottom. I click the, I click my bait caster in gear, and I, I do a double pump. I always double pump my spoon, always. So I do my double pump, and then I let it slam into the bottom. I let that spoon just crash into the bottom, and then I do it again, and it crashes into the bottom. Well, every time the spoon crashes into the bottom, two things happen. One, it makes noise. The fish can hear that clang, clang, clang. And the other thing, it's kicking up that dust cloud. It's kicking mm -hmm. up that dust cloud. So when the smallie come in to look at it, all of a sudden, this 
silver flash or gold flash comes flying up past his face, they annihilate it. Like yeah. the bites, the bites are ferocious when they hit this thing. And go ahead. So structure fishing, you're you're more more or less casting that spoon to the structure or no, or is this straight down? It's straight always down, vertical. Always vertical. Yeah. If I'm going to do, if I'm going to do a more of a horizontal presentation with a spoon, I, I'll use those bigger casting spoons Okay, for it. Because yeah. here, look, another little misnomer is that you got to use tiny little things to catch small mouth. That's crap. I catch small mouths on gigantic lures. DD-22s, fat free shad number sevens, those crankbaits catch more big small mouth for me than any crankbait I own. Wow. And, and it, people don't understand it. The small mouth is, they're so aggressive and you have to appeal to their predatory nature. Like KVD, man, you, if you watch him throw a jerk bait, you don't think your arm can handle fishing it like that all day long. He's wild with that jerk bait, mm -hmm. but he appeals to the the predator nature of that small mouth. A small mouth is like a cat. If you ever tease a cat with a toy, you move it, the small mouth, the cat moves, you move it, the cat moves, you stop it and leave it sit for a second. And the cat stares at it. And the minute that thing twitches, he pounces on it because mm -hmm. they can't stand it. Well, small mouth are exactly the same. Yeah, dude, this is awesome. So this is what I love about <laughs> these podcasts. When I have, uh, you know, an eye opening experience, I know the viewers are really going to appreciate this. Uh, I got to circle back on the spoon real quick here. Do uh, it. can you talk about the setup as far as rod and reel goes yeah. uh, with that? Yeah, that's a good, that's actually a good point. Um, I, 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 I prefer seven foot two for the most part, because mm -hmm. I can keep it fairly close to the boat. I don't ever fish smaller than a seven footer because I want leverage because right. most of the time I'm spooning super deep. 17 pound fluorocarbon is probably, well, it is the only thing I spoon with. Mm -hmm. and, and I only spoon with three quarter ounce spoons. Three quarters. Um, okay. Yeah. Listen, you could go to lighter spoons and drop down line size, but, but you're playing. I mean, I want that spoon to get right down where the business is and I want it to do its job. If I use a smaller spoon, I got to wait for it to go down. Then it's not giving me a straight fall. Sometimes it swings out from my cone and I can't see it on my cone angle till it comes back. It's too much trouble. I use the heavy one. I've never seen an instance where when I'm spooning that it mattered if I went smaller. So I go big, mm -hmm. I go big or go home, you know, and you're, you're appealing to a good, you're appealing to a real good size class of fish too. Although right. you do catch a lot of two pounders on it, you know, sure. if that's, if that's what you're around, that's what you're catching. What well, what's the best action you think for the rod for, for a, a three quarter inch uh, um, spoon? I like a, I like a real fast tip. I want the tip to give a little bit. Cause I, you, you, I want the, the lure to be snappy. So when the tip flexes, when I go to do my double pump, when the tip mm -hmm. flexes, it helps the action of the lure. If the rod's too stiff, the lure becomes, it's like stiff. You know what I mean? It doesn't, right. it doesn't shoot. It doesn't flutter. And it, okay. you know, it's too stiff. So I like that, you know, super fast tip. I like a medium heavy because I want, heavy. I want backbone. Okay. Yeah. I want the backbone. So medium heavy. I, I mean, every, every rod's different, obviously, but to get yeah. people kind of in the ballpark, you know, you want to pick up like a medium heavy, of course, you know, I suggest testing it out and making sure it's the right tip, uh, fast or maybe extra fast or yeah. just, yeah, either yeah. one, okay. um, never a composite, always graphite. Right. Yeah. I don't, you know, interesting. Yeah. Okay. I always graphite. I want to feel everything. Cause a lot of times they hit it on the fall. And if mm -hmm. your rods too soft, or if it's a composite, you may not feel that, you know, hit as it's falling. If you have fish on, on the graph and they're not being spooked and let's say you're in 15, 18, are you going to use that spoon that shallow or is that, do you prefer to be a little bit deeper? No, I'll, I'll use it that shallow. Well, if I okay. can't get them going, if I can't get them going on something, I can get them fired up on the spoon. And then perhaps maybe the spoon's not the best option. Then I can go with a drop shot or a football jig or something and get them fired up. You know, I'll get them fired up with that spoon. But that spoon, I've seen that spoon catch fish that wanted nothing to do with a lure. 
That's why I never, that's why I never hit the lakes without it. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Dang, dude. Uh, uh, uh yeah, I want to tie on a spoon right now and get out <laughs> there, man, for real. Uh, good stuff. So that CC spoon, three quarter ounce, that's pretty much, you don't straight silver. Do you go gold? Do you do hammered? Is there anything? You yeah, it's, it, it's a hammered spoon. Uh, mm -hmm. War Eagle actually makes some pretty good colored spoons. Um, yeah. Gold every now and then. A lot okay. of guys get on the gold kick. Um, I have, I can't say I don't throw them because I have hundred mm -hmm. pounds of them, but you know what I'm saying? But most of the time it's silver. Right, right. Are you going to throw that around fish that are actively that you know are not really chasing bait fish? There's no, there's no smelt. There's no alewives. They're they're eating gobies. Are you still going to try to target them with that spoon? Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah, because because I, I, I'm what I'm doing is it's all I'm triggering. It's mm -hmm. all a trigger. Uh, the mm -hmm. double pump, slamming it into the bottom. It, it fires these fish up. These fish can't stand it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've heard stories of guys taking their uh, plug knockers. You remember the old plug knockers used to have like a treble hook on them, but they weren't. A, it wasn't a hook. It just had hooked wire on them and a sure. weight. Yep. And they'd throw that stupid thing out there and drag it over their crankbait, try and get their crankbait out. I've heard guys have actually cut hooking and landing smallmouth on them things. Yeah, dragging yeah. them on the bottom, trying to get their crankbait. A smallmouth <laughs> comes and takes it. Wow. So, I mean, you're you're talking about a fish that is a bad ombre. I mean, yeah. they're they're the baddest cat on the block. You know what I mean? So, so you know why play when you don't yeah. have to play? You know, like parts of the St. Lawrence River where the water's drinking glass clear. You know, you'll see guys throw the spy baits on them and stuff like that. Real finessey type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um because the water's so super clear and they're fishing, you know, seven feet deep. So they're mm -hmm. launching long casts. They don't want to be seen. So they're, you know, it's more stealthy, but for yeah. the most part, small mouth dude, they're animals. Right. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, yeah, dude, this was, uh, awesome. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we're 50 minutes deep. We are running out of time. I know we could, you could talk for hours on so many different topics. It sucks that we didn't even get, you know, near as much information as that I, I or questions that I have for you, but this was, this was awesome from the stories to, uh, just this spooning technique, the spooning to, I, I keep going back to this cause obviously okay. fired up. great lakes, pretty much inland lakes, wherever you got deep yeah. fish, try wherever, it. Right. Right. And dude, large mouth and spotted bass. Mm -hmm. I catch a lot of fish on this spoon. <laughs> People yeah. don't understand. I mean, there's, you know, there's obviously better times for large mouth fishing it and for spotted bass fishing it, but sure, dude, that spoon is, uh, you know, that's awesome. always, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I never yeah. leave home without them. <laughs> Man. All right. We do have, we do have to ask two questions. I like to ask everybody. And the first one's going to be, uh, I'd love to know your personal best small mouth and kind of, uh, maybe a story that goes along with it. My personal best is a seven one, uh, but I caught two of them mm. back to back. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. no, no, they weren't on a spoon. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> they were actually on a tube. Uh, -huh, uh sure. I was stroking a three quarter ounce tube. Right. And, um, you know, cast a whoop, whoop, stroking the thing. And I got back to backers, uh, the story to go with it. Uh, it's too long to get into, but it was, uh, I was doing a, an event for a sponsor and I had four guys that I had to take out that won this fishing trip and they all wanted to be together. So I called a friend of mine who was another touring pro at the time to come and help me to take two of the guys and mm -hmm. I'll take two. So he wanted to do it and, uh, <laughs> he wanted to make it into a tournament. And I said, uh, are you sure you want to do this? And he said, yeah, I'm sure. I mm -hmm. said, okay, what's it going to be? Biggest, best, best five, biggest sure. fish. He said, biggest fish. And I told my guys, I said, he's lying. He's bringing five. So we're going to bring five back. Mm -hmm. And my, the guys I was with said, we want to go large mouth fishing. Uh -huh. And I'm like, <laughs> right. Dude, we're on Lake Erie. Sure. You know what I mean? Why do you, we were actually in the Detroit river. Okay. I go, I was like taken back. I'm like, why do you want to go? Yeah, we went a largemouth fish. So I took them largemouth fishing and we did good. I mean, we caught mm -hmm. probably 17, 18 pounds for five. I said, 
we, we have to go, we have to go out. Uh -huh. And so they're like, yeah, cool. So I'd run them out. We go out long and short of it is the dudes with me. They never caught big fish before. Mm -hmm. So the one guy with me winds up catching a smallie over four. And I sure. go, Oh, that'll work, dude. That'll right. work. You know yeah. what I mean? So I, I reach down, I snatch that fish. I pop his tube out. I throw it in the live wall. I'm like, right on so i fire a cast out there i stroke that tube whack i get one about five five and a half i reel it in i grab that four and a half pounder i throw it out i throw the five in there and he's like Whoa, what are you doing dude sure. i go what do you what do you mean i go mine that one's bigger he goes it's the biggest fish i ever caught in my life uh, and i'm like oh, oh man sure. <laughs> i didn't think you know i yep, don't what yep. do i know i'm in like turn yeah. mode. Yeah. so anyway so we come in with five and the smallest one was the five and a half Jeez. and i had those two seven well Jeez. one was actually 615 the other was seven one sure and sure. so so <laughs> i told my dudes i said hey whatever happens whatever this guy pulls out of his live well just pretend it's the biggest fish you ever seen in right your right. life so they're like hey, there he's pulling out. he had nice fish too and he hey. stayed in the river the whole day uh -huh. and, and he had a he had a good bag they were all you know solid you know three and a half to three tens and um he kept pulling them out and he's smiling pulling right. them out smiling i i reach i fumble around i pull that <laughs> five pounder out i go oh Oh, that's the wrong one. That's the small one. Oh, and I chuck geez. them in, you know what I mean? That's and every awesome. one I pull out is bigger and bigger. And then sure. I grab the two sevens and I grabbed them both together and pulled them out together. And, right. and they're just like, oh, yeah, my God. Crazy. So, yeah, it was awesome. Dang. It was awesome. What time of year? Yeah, it had to be fall because fall? it was yeah. freezing cold. Yeah, was it? it had okay. to be fall. Sure, sure. Yeah. If I could tell you, I'm, I, you know, this is uh, make believe here, but. <laughs> if you could only use one bait for, for the rest of, not your life, let's just say for next year to catch smallmouth on, you're only allowed to bring one bait with you whenever you go smallmouth fishing. What is that bait going to be? Can I fish it any way I want? You can fish it whatever you, whichever way you want to fish it. You can only just tie on one bait. Uh, I'll take a four inch yum dinger. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Because I, because I, I can fish it so many different ways. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. can be versatile. Let's talk about that real quick because I'm a, a, a huge fan of, uh, you know, plastic stick bait, stuff like that for smallmouth. There's a lot of different ways to rig it. I'd love to hear, you know, a couple of your favorite ways to fish that, that, that profile bait. Um, first and foremost, I love drop shotting it, mm -hmm. uh, but I throw it on a net head a lot too. And I throw it on heavy jig heads too, half ounce, three eighths get it down there working. But when I'm, you know, when I, a lot of times when I'm Ned fishing, believe it or not, I'll go to the five inch dinger. Sure. Because I yeah. appeal to a better size class of fish. Okay. And so that's what I'll do. So I know it's not the four inch, but it's, you know. Right. Are you experimenting as far as uh, on the drop shot with that four inch? Uh, are you nose hooking it more, more than often than not? Or do you do a little wacky rigging with it as well? Both. That's a Both great question. That? Both. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Champlain one time, they they preferred it wacky mm -hmm. um i could catch them traditionally nose hooking it but i caught way more wacky so mm -hmm. i rigged it wacky on the drop shot there mm -hmm. uh just that one tournament but um you know and it was my non-boater that kind of i kind of he was throwing he was throwing a, a finesse worm wacky style and i'm like man he's catching more than me mm -hmm. so i switched mine out to wacky rig and plowed them so All right. like, hey, thanks. <laughs> Let's take it one step further. You, we know the bait. Now I need to know the color. One color for the rest of the year. I would go green pumpkin purple or green pumpkin blue. That's two colors, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You I'll pick go. your best one. Holy moly. I'm going to go old school. I'm going to go green pumpkin purple. Fair enough. Fair enough. Man, good stuff. I'm actually excited. Uh, I, I've been asking this question to every guest that we've had on so far, uh -oh. and uh, <laughs> you're the you're the first person to talk about you know a, a four inch like stick bait, you know senko type yum dinger type of bait. And uh, finally, because that's actually if someone was to ask my, me that same question, that's exactly what I would would say as well. Uh, you know, we had a lot of people say tubes and swim baits and this and that and Ned rigs and yeah, they're, they all work great. But for some reason, you know, just like you, I really gravitate towards that technique. I love the fact that people got to keep in mind, 
it's not always, and you just mentioned it with Champlain and your experience there with your co-angler. Wacky rigging that thing sometimes special things can happen. Oh, when yeah. You fish those baits that way. Um, there's just something about it. I always have one tied on my boat, just like you got your – now I'm going to have a spoon tied on too, <laughs> after this. But, man, awesome stuff. Listen, <laughs> we, we we certainly ran out of time, Frank. I, I certainly appreciate you coming on with us. A wealth of information. Super hey, cool. It's, Super it's cool. small mouth crush. How could I not come on this show? Right, right. There you go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, what's the best way for people to follow you? Um, you know, keep up with what you're doing. Uh, you got any, you know, as far as social media, things like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I have an Instagram page. It's, it's uh scalish underscore fishing. Um, I'm doing a lot of videos on the lure net channel. Uh, they're all, they're all, they're more instructional. It's not like fish porn where I just go out and slam big fish. I actually teach what I'm doing. So people understand how, you know, exactly how the hows and whys and stuff. Um, I do bass talk live every Thursday on day four. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, and you know, I'm getting around a right, little. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely well man uh best of luck in the future you're always welcome back here and anytime thank you, thank you for coming on yeah awesome and thank everybody for watching and listening to the podcast and as always until next time we'll see you on the water thanks so much for listening today make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on instagram at smallmouth crush also the youtube channel smallmouth crush and if you feel so inclined please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below and as always until next time we'll see you on the water